The automobile is one of the most important inventions that revolutionized the modern world. In America, the rich history of car culture runs deep as technology continues to shape the future of the industry. Jason Stein, former publisher of Automotive News, is here to share the stories of people passionate about cars, from industry leaders and innovators to car-obsessed celebrities. Buckle up as Jason takes you inside the boardroom, onto the track, and around the bend on Cars and Culture on Sirius XM Business Radio. Welcome into episode 142 of Cars and Culture on Sirius XM. It's good to have you back listening again. I'm your host, Jason Stein. The dream of the young man who would grow up to own the car auction world started appropriately enough at a classic car auction, just not one he ever intended to be at. It was 50 years ago this year in the parking lot of a motel in California, and Rob Myers was on a three-month motorcycle tour of North America on a brand new Harley. He stopped at that motel for the night, and as the story goes, was awakened the next morning by the sound of roaring engines from the parking lot next door. They were Thunderbirds, classic Ford Thunderbirds, everywhere. One even owned by a Hollywood actress. And it was an auction. A beautiful set of cars. What a concept for a kid who had never seen such a thing. And what a starter for a roaring passion that would go through Rob's mind and his career. How does a kid who only knew how to fix vehicles eventually rise to lead one of the leading auction houses of the world? With a passion that goes back to that first day that is exemplified literally today. 50 years later, as Rob Myers readies RM Sotheby's to host Moda Miami at the Biltmore Miami, longtime friends in the industry will bring their amazing vehicles and celebrity chefs will cook multi-course dinners and people will flock to South Florida to see what the auction fuss is all about. And Moda Miami is a gigantic fuss in the industry as it prepares to take on the Amelia Concours just up the state in Jacksonville on the same weekend. Cars and culture battling it out for supremacy. But Rob Myers has always been at the center of history. When he was auctioning off vehicles that set world records or when he was placing best in show at Pebble Beach countless times in the decades that he's been in the business. RMS hosts events around the world where collector cars can sell for upwards of millions. He's all about the high-end cars, the trendsetters, and history. He's about Formula One cars, cars that Steve McQueen has owned and driven, or cars that are simply the best barn finds on the planet. Today, ahead of this weekend's Moda Miami, Rob Myers tells his story, the story of cars and culture. Rob, it's been a little while. I know we've seen each other in all kinds of different places. It is a pleasure to have you on Cars and Culture with Jason Stein. Welcome in. Nice to see you, Jason. Been a while. Yeah. You got a little event uh, I know we're going to get to, but just uh, g- give me the lay of the land. You're you're a, you're a few days away from launching uh, Miami and uh, being in Miami and launching Moda. Tell me about Moda. Um, what's to tell? What's to tell? I got a great bunch of cars that some friends of mine have supported us immensely. We've got uh, cars from around the world. Mercedes-Benz sent us, sent us the Fangio winning WN54 Mercedes from Germany. So it's rarely seen, if ever seen, in the United States. Some friends of mine have sent cars we have eight cars that will be on display in Moda that were previous best of show winners in Pebble Beach, along with about another 150 special pieces that will be on exhibition Saturday and Sunday here at the Biltmore. Then on Sunday, we have another 100 cars coming in for Supercar Sunday. So we're, you know, we've got some great things, things that you won't normally see anywhere in the world. And yeah, we're going to put it on this weekend with the uh, the Concord Lifestyles event. We've got Carbone dinners, Casatua dinners, Water Lilies, all kinds of things happening here. You, you and I have always talked straight with each other. Why did you want to do this? Um. Well, as you know, I was with Bill Warner in Amelia Island for twenty five years. Helped him build the Concorn Amelia. Um, Bill was getting old, wanting to retire. Sold his event, good for him, to Haggerty Insurance for what I consider to be a lot of money. 
and they bought it. And so I thought, well, you know, they've also went public, started this auction company with some of my past employees. And it kind of motivated me to think, well, first of all, you know, after 25 years of doing something in Fernanda Beach or whatever it's called, Amelia Island, it was getting a little bit boring. It's not the easiest place to get to. The year before this all happened with Haggerty and all this nonsense took place, we had did an auction in Miami at a really cool parking structure, downtown Miami. And it's kind of an international city. It's one of the most exciting cities in North America right now. You know, the construction, everything that's going on, design district and fashion and food and luxury. Miami's an explosive market. And that, you know, it's time to get out of Amelia Island. A little bit boring. And it's in kind of the middle of nowhere. We thought the market's changing. You know, the car collecting is changing. I see a swing in our in our um, auctions where we're selling a lot of more supercars and what we call uh, young timer type cars, you know, 70s, 80s, 90s. And I thought Miami's a lot more of a lively area. The car culture here is unbelievable. We thought it's a good time to do something else besides Amelia Island. And I was, you know, to be honest, a little bit pissed off about Haggerty and Broad Arrow and all that nonsense. It kind of motivated me. And then I just, then I thought, you know, it's also a really good change for us. We're a young, dynamic company and we want to be, I want to have a, a concourse and auction events that are more lifestyles friendly and not your same old, same old. So we thought, let's give it a go here. So away we go. And we're going to make it happen this weekend. Amazing. How much planning did you put into it? A year's planning. I've got a, a big team in place. My staff's unbelievable. And the uh, everybody, you know, bought into this deal. We said, okay, let's do it. No one really but our company could pull off something what we're about to pull off. And I'm very proud of it. And it's real exciting, you know, very, very exciting. New market. The, the culture here is very unique. Our database is exploding with all the new clients and everything. We just say, you know, this is so great. It's fresh. It's new. And we're going to kill our, our – our, uh, we've had so much support from long-term clients and new clients, and we're going to kill people with kindness. And, you know, it's like – Last year, a very good friend of mine showed a card a million. He said, after it was all done, he said, hell, I never got to thank you for spending 50 grand to come here and show my car for the weekend. He said, I'm just kind of tired of that. So we're going to kill him with kindness here and really let people know that we are very appreciative of what they're doing for us, you know? So it's, it's exciting. What will success look like for you? It already does. It already does. It already does. Yeah, I mean... I'm watching the last few days our build out, dealing with this hotel. I mean, a year ago, I didn't know where Coral Gables was. I didn't know it was a suburb of Miami. I didn't know there was a Biltmore Hotel that even existed in Florida. So I'm watching it now, and I say, you know, I told a couple of the team last night, I said, no one but us could pull this off. So it's, in my mind, already a success. And I believe that, you know, it's going to be so fresh and out of the box that, yeah, I think it's very successful. Do car yep. shows do car shows like this? I mean, you've 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 been to a couple of them. Do do they yeah. need this kind of energy to them? Do they need a, a shot in the arm? Do they need to be reinvented and reinvigorated while still keeping that car culture that you just talked about? I think so. I mean, <clears throat> I've watched it for years, as you know. We've won our company has won best to show up Pebble Beach eight times in the last fifteen years. I've watched the judging take place. I've watched Bill Warner and Emiliano with 70 judges lined up. And, and I know a lot of those judges. A lot of them are friends of mine that have been over the years. But I also look at and I think, why do you need all this judging to take place? And like with the thing we're doing in Miami, you know, I've got the Mormon Meteor. I've got the Daimler Double Six and so many other great cars. How do you have a best of show? Like, really? 
Right. And when we've got this kind of product, there's no such thing as a best of show. And so we're not really going to have a best of show. We're going to give recognition to great cars and we're going to keep it light. We're going to have, um, we're going to have, so if your car is one of 10 in that class, then we're asking you to pick in your opinion, what the most important and best car is in your class. So we're going to have peer judging. I look at a lot of the judging that goes on and I look at some of the people doing it and I say, they really don't know what the hell they're looking at, to be honest, like be blunt and honest, you know? So yeah, this is what we're doing. And I think it's going to, it's a really good thing. I think it's a real fresh approach to the concourse market and to way we're, we're going to treat the people when they get here and, we want to make it more lifestyles and, you know, like Sunday afternoon at the close of the, uh, the concour, what the hell are we going to have here? Uh, mariachi dancers. <laughs> yeah. We're going to have like blow it up with mariachi dancers and drummers and all that. You know, I don't want the one car coming up as best as show and the, and the cannons go off and all that stuff. We'll make it different, make it unique, make it alive. I love it. Yeah. Let's talk. Yeah, a, me too. Let's talk We're a little bit about it. it. Yeah, for sure. And congratulations on 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 all of this launching uh, this coming weekend. Uh, let Let's go back a little bit for the audience members who don't know. Uh, how is it to be the RM of RM Sotheby's to get that recognition? Rob took a lot of effort, didn't it? Yeah. I'm 45 years in business. I'm a very um, focused entrepreneur. When people tell me I can't do something, it motivates me to do it even more. And yeah, and uh, we've built an amazing team in our company in over 45 years. Our restoration shop is one of the, if not the best in the world, it for sure is one of the best. It's won more Pebble Beach awards and more awards in a million Villa Dest and all over the world than any other company has. And, you know, it, as you keep going and growing the company over the years, as I have, you just become more and more proud of the company and what you've achieved and the people around you. Cause you know, without the people around you, you, you can't achieve the things we've achieved. Yeah. So it's, it's kind of cool. Yeah. Uh, you, so you, for an um, old country boy from Chatham, I've done okay. <laughs> I, I would say so. And the you've old been to our place, I have been, you've, you've actually toured me around it and it's, it's, it's impressive beyond words. Um, and actually, Gore Duff has been on this program last year and did a, a wonderful walkthrough with everything that, that you have there. I want to go back to working with your dad. And and you, you worked on cars with him since you were little. And even when you started high school, he gave you a beat-up Ford Edsel. Is that where it all started? Pretty much. I wasn't really a fan of high school. Um my parents didn't have any money, so I got this old Edsel, and he bought his first new car in 1968, and I took the Edsel, which was an old rotted-out bunch of junk. I fixed it up and used it as my first car to go to school in, and the day I went to high school, I don't know if I told you, this, the day I went there, a kid that was going to high school at a 650 Triumph Bonneville, and I ended up trading him an Edsel for the Bonneville. I got home, my dad about lost his mind on me, and but so I had that Bonneville for a number of years and I rode it winter and summer. And I ended up buying an old 40 Plymouth four door sedan that a fellow had bought new and he went to war and passed away. So I had a low mileage Plymouth sedan. I drove that between that and my Triumph uh, motorcycle. I went and used that while I was in high school. And in fact, a member, and it got me motivated. A member of the lo local antique car club offered to buy that Plymouth off you, sold it to you for 10,000 bucks, right? Yeah, yeah. I think it was less than that. I think yeah. it was. Well, it's a lot but, of money back then. So you, oh, and, yeah. you get into fixing cars and bikes, and 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 pretty soon you figure out, you know what, we can do this for a living. And so you start you start off in a 15-bay garage, and you do body work. No, five, no, no, one-bay garage, not 15 bays. Okay. 15 bays, I would have been in heaven. 
Oh, was that that was after a few years you got you That's got to right. I built my first yeah 40 by 80 shop which would have been about 15 bays I built that in 1980 79 and 80 yeah that's when I went big time yeah <laughs> and yeah why did you get into collecting cars well it's <laughs> interesting I was always good with my hands and fixing things and I always had a six cents for buying things at the right price and at the right moment. Yeah. And I just liked it. I just liked it. And why not? This is a pretty, you know, I've always said to people, if you find what you really love to do as your passion, the money will follow you and it's not work, you know? And so if you work a hundred hours a week back then, I enjoyed it so much and still do that. It's not work for me. It's it's what I like to do. You know, I'm yeah. not one to go sit on the beach and read a book. <laughs> right. Did you collect yeah. things as a, as a child? Did you collect baseball cards or, you know, marbles? Like marbles. Okay. Marbles. Yeah. Still have a lot of them. <laughs> okay. All right. Yeah. yeah. Tell me how the collector car market has changed over the last 40 years. Um, well, I think as much as anything, our company has changed along with the market in the sense that back in the early days, I used to do a lot of Mustangs, a lot of Shelby Cobras and Shelbys and Z28 Camaros and those types of things. And over the years, we just could not afford to restore Camaros or Mustangs because they're the restoration costs are so expensive. So I started to get into the big heavy classics like Duesenbergs and big important Packards and French cars and all of that. Because, you know, it made sense to spend a million dollars restoring a car that could be worth four or five versus spend, you know, a hundred grand on Camaro that was going to be worth 40 or 50. So we, we sort of lost our, I don't want to say lost our way in muscle cars. We still deal in muscle cars, but it's not our strong point. Today, our strong point is the higher end in things like, you know, we sold the Mercedes last year for 150 something million. The Olin We broke, yeah, the Olin Coupe. We've broken our record of selling the most expensive car in the world. Probably, I don't know. We've held it forever. And when a new record is broken, it's typically us that have sold it. I believe I know we've sold the most expensive things in the world time and time again. And the market people back old days say, oh, Model T Ford in 20 years from now will be worth nothing. And I watched, you know, Model T Fords, a really good, important Model T that they didn't make a million of is still quite valuable today. So the market, you know, it's just broad because of all the number of car shows and cars and coffee and weekend events. So the size of the market has exploded over the last 20, 30 years. But, and the buyers yeah. have changed too, right? I mean, the who who is now sitting there with a paddle is very different than what it was before. I mean, did the dot, did the dot, was it a good thing that the dot com millionaires got into the hobby? You know, I don't know how many of them are truly into it. I know that, uh, like in Silicon Valley, everybody said, oh, you need to do an auction there. There's all this money. You know, what I find is money around is everywhere in the world today. Mm -hmm. And I think it's because of the a number of events, a number of car shows, a number of automobile functions, whether it be Porsche or Mercedes or Jaguar, the number of clubs, the number of publications, number of radio shows like yourself has started. Mm -hmm. That has put fire, you know, fuel on the fire of the collector car market. And so I don't, I wouldn't necessarily say, hey, the market's gotten a lot stronger because of dot coms, because I don't believe that really is the case. I think it's just, hey, it's a great hobby for people. You can, you know, you can see your investment. You can look at it. It's a lot more fun than the stock market. Yeah, did did COVID? I mean, COVID must have changed it. There was so much money on the sidelines for a while, right? Well, we were lucky in the sense that we had our online platforms almost ready to go when COVID hit, and okay. it forced us to hurry up and do it. So, 
company wise, we never messed. We really never missed missed a beat. I mean, it actually became more profitable for us to be selling online versus live auction. And I was just, I'm kind of blown away by the number of transactions that are done online today. Like with this, bring a trailer. Companies like ours that are selling an enormous number of cars. I never believed in a million years that we'd sell a car for five million dollars on a computer, but it's yeah. true and it's happening today. Well, I've yeah. been to, I've been to so many of your auctions, including just last last uh, summer at uh, uh, Monterey. It surprised me, Rob, the number of people who are actually are not in the room who are right. bidding on things on a regular basis. You've got more people on a phone bank than you do in the room bidding. <laughs> Yeah, we do a lot on the phone. A lot, of, a lot of people are bidding on their laptops today and on their iPads and on their phones and don't need to be, you know, you see a lot of people come in, they'll inspect what they're interested in. They'll like it. Then they'll take off and then they're bidding by phone and they're comfortable with it. And our staff have gone through the, the vehicle or whatever it is that they're purchasing and made sure that they're fully aware of what it is and the condition and history and things like that. It's become a lot more detailed than it used to be when the days of Cruise International and some of the old time auction houses, you know, a lot of them don't exist today. I ended up buying Cruise International about 10 years ago. Right. After eBay got done with it. Remember? Yep. Yeah. Yep, I do. So, yeah. Yeah. I want to, I want to talk about some of your, your great finds because the, the listeners would not have heard these stories, but I've read them and you've, told me about them. I want to go back to 1998 when you got a phone call from a friend who had a pretty incredible story. And the man had been contacted by someone whose father had recently died and they left behind a certain 1934 vehicle. That was the Packard custom Dietrich. Do you, do you remember they, they only Packard only built about four of those V 12s and there were right. around the classic car circles that there was a fourth one that was out there. So they went to, right? You went to New Jersey. Oh, yeah, yeah. It was in, the one that was in, uh, boarded up in a garage. The secret room, Rob. Yes, that's right. Tell me about that. Yeah. Yeah. No, I remember doing that. And at the time, no one had knew about the car. And this fellow called me and ended up going out there and seeing it and thought, oh, there's the missing car that had been hidden away forever. Yes. And we bought it and restored it and won best to show up Pebble Beach. Yeah. Not only that. And that just... I'm it, sorry. Go ahead. It went for three quarters of a million dollars eventually, right? <laughs> yeah. You know, that's funny about four weeks ago. I don't want to mention his name, but you probably know the guy who's in Michigan. He's got a couple of little uh, called gin mills and been around forever. Doesn't do email, doesn't have a an iPhone really lays back in the woods. He's on this, a uh, 34 Packard custom Dietrich convertible coupe. There's uh three in the world and he's on this forever and ever. Gord Duff and a couple of my guys went to see it and he's thinking about it. Very slow moving, very soft spoken man. And I went over a couple weeks ago, and finally, after trying to buy this car for, oh, probably 30 years, I finally got a bot last weekend. Huh. And we're going to do, re do a restoration on it. Yeah. Amazing. You still get it? It's amazing what the prices are compared to what they were 20 years ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you still get excited? Now it's millions. Do you get excited about the rare finds? Sure, it's always fun. It's yeah. always fun. It's always fun. Are they still yeah. out there lurking somewhere? Are they still are they still under a under a barn somewhere? We we talked you know a couple of years ago talked to Jay Leno about his favorite barn finds. They they they're still out there, right? Yeah, but the great stuff is rarely. Yeah, it's pretty much known now. Every once in a while, something will pop up. Yeah, still out there a little bit for sure. Yeah. One of your friends. Yeah was uh, also a gentleman who I, I knew quite well, uh, Carol Shelby. Tell me a little right. bit, uh, tell me about Carol and, 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 and the way that the way that he was and about the kinds of cars that he had that, that you were able to see. Well, as you know, he was a very unique individual, Texan, very successful in his racing career in a great sense of humor. The, uh, 
just yeah, he was just a such a unique individual. I it's funny, I became friends with him as he was becoming elderly the last 25 years of his life. We just hit it off. He was a wheeler dealer. So him and I do quite a few deals together just on a handshake and like this. He liked action. You know, he was all about action and being active and having his mind active. And so, you know, and then when he passed away, he left it in his will that I was the only one ever going to sell the very first Cobra, which we did successfully about oh, probably eight years ago now or 10 years ago or something. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I think he brought about sixteen million, and um, yeah, we just became really good buddies. I still have. It was funny one day. Um, one day, a reliable transport truck pulled into his place in Las Vegas, and him and I are sitting in the back enjoying a beer and sucking in the sun. And this transport guy unloads two four GTs, and his wife comes out at that time, Cleo, and says, "Oh, look, Carol, there's a." A red one for you and a blue one for me. And he said, no, no, no. He said, don't. I made a deal with Rob and he's going to have the blue one. So I'm keeping the red one. He gets the blue one, which I still have today. I put it away for my grandson. <laughs> and, uh, but just, you know, really fun individuals, had great sense of humor. So, and we're all, we're hosting, he'd be 101 years old right now. So we're hosting this uh, Shelby 101 exhibition here in Miami and, we're going to have an amazing number of Shelby's and Cobras coming in uh, this weekend. That'll be on exhibition through the Shelby Club and through Shelby North America. And and, 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 and we're honoring Carol for his 101st birthday. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. You named your son after him, didn't you? You know, I named my son Shelby, but truly it was not after him. I always liked the name. I guess there was some influence, but... Not really. I just like the name Shelby. And, yeah. and you know, I knew Carol then, but I wasn't friends with him. My son's 40 years old, so I wasn't friends with Carol back then. But I always enjoyed the name. Yeah. yeah. What did a guy like Carol or others, what did you learn from, from those folks, Rob? To be real. You know, like, after all of the Shelby successes and disappointments and he was always just that from when I knew him to when he died, he was always the same guy. You knew what to expect out of him. He never considered himself a big shot. We're an important person. And yeah, just, he was always himself and he had a great sense of humor and very approachable. Could read people very well. Yeah. Just, you know, I was very fortunate to have become such good friends with him. Yeah, you know, the last twenty years of his life. Yeah. Money, m- money also doesn't bring you pleasure. You've said before, unless you use it, right? That's right. No, yeah. money is a tool. That's all it is. It's right. a tool. It's a tool. Yeah, you know, changes a lot of people's lives, though. You know, as they become wealthier, they some people start to think that they're more important than others, and wow, you know be impressed because I have money, but that's not really it. Yeah. Yeah. Are auctions, would you say, good barometers of the collector car industry? And I would even say part two of the greater economy. I would say so. I mean, everybody waits till we have our auctions to see how the market is. And, you know, cars have just, some cars, not all cars, but a lot, like muscle cars 10 years ago were on fire. And then they got weak and their prices really, really reduced. And now they've become very strong again. And it's a market cycle. And Ferraris have gone insane the last 10 years and Porsches. I mean, um, and yeah, it is a barometer of the economy and the car market that we're in. For sure it is. No question. I've been burning yeah. to ask you this question for years. I finally get a chance. Why is anything associated with Steve McQueen always five times the value of what, what it normally would be? Um, you know, he was an icon, right? Yeah. He was a, he loved cars. He was friends with Jimmy Brocker and his brother. The guy was always into cars and I did not know him or anything, but 
because he was such a movie icon and such a star back in the day. And, you know, the, the movies like, um, oh, what's the one in San Francisco where what? he used that Mustang? Bullet. Yeah. You know, or I always remember the one we drove the Nard Spider in that. Um, it was a really good movie he did back in the day uh, about stealing artwork and whatnot. Thomas Crown Affair. That was good, you know. And he always featured good cars in the, like, Thomas Crown Affair, he had that Nard Spider. I mean, what kind of cool car was that to be driving back then? Yeah, so his cars have always brought, you know, if a, let's say a Nard Spider was normal, one was 10 million, his would bring 20 or 25, something to it, yeah. You know, a couple other people were like that as well, but not to the level that McQueen was. It's incredible. And what yeah. is yeah. Yeah. Final, final 10 minutes here or so, Rob. Um, when you when you think about the future, and you, you mentioned earlier, your team had the distinction of publicly selling the single most expensive car, the the uh, Ulan Hout um, Mercedes that you mentioned. What, what other cars are out there that you believe could give maybe a car like that a run for its money in terms of the so-called value or worth? I don't think there is one. Like the W154 that Fangio won Le Mans in that we're going to have on display this weekend, that could be, you know, something of a similar value. But there's not many. I don't know of a car that would bring more than $125 million today. That car was 135 million euros. So I think that that record of most valuable car was sold publicly or anywhere in the world i think that will stand my opinion it'll stand for quite a while yeah i mean we sold a really good gto in november and that was 52 million you know so i think it's uh there's not many cars like that in the world of that value i wouldn't yeah. know of another one honestly did it surprise maybe uh, you? i'm sorry did it surprise you that, that it was able to fetch that much i think mean, yeah i think it surprised everybody in the world yeah. Yes. Yeah. You were going to say that there was another car. You were you were just about to say when I interrupted you. Well, there is one car that I know of that it could possibly do something, but I really don't want to say what it is because um, I'd like to sell it. I'm, I've been working on it. <laughs> <laughs> you never know. Right? Yeah, for sure. Where do you think the collector car hobby will be in the next 20 years, 30 years? I think it will continue to grow as it becomes more and more interesting cars. You know, um, some will get a little weaker, some will get stronger. I've always told people, buy what you love. Don't buy for, you know, some people buy for investments. And I think, firstly, you have to love what you're buying. And you've got to be educated on what you're buying. And, you know, it's like anything else, uh, Make it an intelligent person for what you want to do with it. Intelligent investment. And that firstly starts with having pleasure from what you own. So I think it's just going to continue to grow, honestly. Yeah. The, the enthusiasm and the interest is not dying off. It's growing majorly. What's the next, yeah. what's the next big segment? And, you know, not that, I'm asking you to call your shot, but what, but what's the next big thing? Are, are station wagons or minivans far from being sought out? I think so. Yeah. There's a culture for minivans. There's a culture for like the Volkswagen vans, the Westphalias and things like that. There's a culture for station wagons. I personally like them myself. Um, but I don't think that, you know, buying a 67 Ford Country Squire station wagon is going to go up 10 times in value in the next five years. I think a lot of, um, yeah, it's different. It's different. It depends on the age. You know, I watch a lot of people don't even get involved in this stuff till they're in their 60s and 70s, and they have plenty of money to afford it because it can be an expensive hobby. Yeah. But it depends on what level you're at. You know, you can still buy four bears and you can still buy, you know, Datsun 240Zs. I said a long time ago, I, 
I think investment, if you could buy a Datsun 240Z, a real early car, they were like ten, fifteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 back then. And now they're, hell, I guess a really great early 240 is probably 150000 today. Yeah. So there's always going to be that kind of stuff. You Do you know? think with this, I mean, the push into EVs and, you know, I know the pendulum's swinging a little bit on both sides either way, but... Won't internal combustion engine vehicles just be the rage about 20 or 30 years from now? Maybe. I think so. Yeah, I think so. I, I don't see, I mean, some ele- some of the electric cars, I guess, but I don't see those uh, those being the rage for a long time. You know, they're, they're building sort of some of the electric stuff and some of this stuff that um, – I just seen that new Tesla. It looks like a sheet metal worker built it. You know, <laughs> the, I mean, the, uh, the pickup truck. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's so bizarre. <laughs> Can you imagine saying, "Hey, I own chassis number one of those"? I think you'd say, "Who cares?" Like, I don't get it. But so I don't see that stuff being very. They're more disposed. You know, the stuff they're building today is that they're almost like underwear or diapers where they're disposable. You know, mm. Mm. but that's just my opinion. Yeah. What do you still admire when it goes across the block? What do you what What catches your fancy? You know, I'm. I guess that's I'm different in that sense that it all catches my fancy. I like it. You know, I like a Datsun 240Z, and I like a Nart Spider, and I like a Ferrari Pontoon Testarossa, and I love a Duesenberg and a Dietrich Packard. You know, I'm kind of all over the place. You know, 300 SL Mercedes Roadster is one of my favorites. You know, I drive one 10,000 miles a year. They're great pieces, you know. So I'm all over the board. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about your your hotel. You 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 took me to it once. Uh, it was uh, a beautiful sight to see. It was uh, completely restored and 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 had a had a wonderful, almost had a bit of a Miami feel to it in the middle of Chatham, Ontario. How is all of that? Yeah, it's pretty good. It's pretty good. I'm putting an addition on it, and I thought remember there was a big shopping center next door to it, which I recently purchased, and we're building a new city hall. In my hometown, a new public library and a museum. I'm building a hotel in Windsor today. I love that stuff. I love restoring old buildings. Boutique hotels is sort of a passion of mine and my daughter. I work with my daughter very closely on it. And it's it's uh, my daughter hates when I say this, but it's it's truly a hobby of it's my hobby. It's not my living. It's my hobby, but it's really fun. I love design, you know. So we're having a lot of fun with it. Yeah, I bet. Yeah. I bet. What's in the I'm building one downtown Windsor right now, right okay. in the heart of downtown. Right yeah. across from Detroit, Michigan. Yeah. Yeah. 120 suites. And they'll be totally unique. Like my one like the boutique I have in Chatham. Yeah. Anything in your personal collection that you uh well, let's just go to Daily Driver here. What what when you go and get into your car to go visit the hotel, are you taking anything and everything, or is there one thing that you particularly like? No, I go to my, I have a 57 300 SL Roadster Mercedes, and that I drive pretty much every day. Yeah, that's my go-to piece. I've got some other stuff, but that's really the car I like to most go to. Yeah. You let me drive. Pretty simple. You let me drive your 64 Shelby Cobra. Um, about, oh, that's right. Yeah. About 10 yeah. years ago. And That's uh, right. Speaking of diapers, I almost filled my pants wondering if I was going to keep it either on the road or avoid crashing. <laughs> because right. that, I still have it. You still have it. It was I a red, have it. red one. Yeah. 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 It was original paint and upholstery. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. 60,000 right. 60, miles. I've shipped it out to California and my son uses it pretty much daily now. And, uh, you know, I'll send it back here for next summer and use it a little bit. Yeah. I've had that for a long time. For a long time. Uh, and that was always one of my favorites as well. Yeah. yeah. Final final few questions, Robin. Really appreciate you taking the time before the the event at Moda Miami. Uh, I was in Las Vegas. You had an enormous, uh, uh, illustrious display of great things that you were auctioning off. And one of them was a, a Lewis Hamilton Formula One car. I mean, could you imagine that in this day and age, 
that, or maybe back when you started, you know, 40 plus years ago, that you'd be auctioning off Formula One cars too, or helmets, or track suits, or anything. Right. Right. Versus. Right. right. The diversification yeah. of business is enormous, isn't it? Yeah. Over the years, we've really widened our company out. And yeah, like that formula, we've, that's another thing. We've, we've sold, um, the most expensive Formula One cars consistently in the world for the last number of years. Um, Michael Schumacher cars and that car we expected. We thought maybe it was 10 million and it ended up around 17 or something. Yeah. That was quite a event in, um, in Las Vegas. It was, yeah. it was amazing. We had a lot, of, we had a lot of fun there. Yeah. I walked through the collection of Mr. Nadal's recently in downtown Toronto with the largest. Oh, we'll be selling that in June. June 1st. Right. Right. The largest. Yeah, we're having breakfast with Miles here tomorrow morning. We're pretty excited about it. We're going to sell millions of dollars in running shoes. <laughs> yeah. He's got almost a thousand pairs of running shoes. I saw them. And he has the original. The original Nikes, the waffle, the waffle Nikes that came right from right. right Oregon. Yeah. yeah. And then he's got the the shoes Michael Jordan wore in the last dance. Yeah. Oh no, it's gonna be an amazing auction. We're really looking forward to that. Yeah. I Cars, seen... shoes, all kinds of things. Paraphernalia. The... Oh, it's wild, isn't it? It is wild. And his gar the garage yeah. piece of it that has more of the racing stuff, the Jimmy Johnson car, the I mean, it, it's it, it's easily one of the most uh, eclectic collections that I'm certainly that I've ever seen. Um, yeah, me too. Yeah, but but that's just exemplary yeah. of 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 what you've what you've made this company into. And I think when you when you look back and you think of, you know, you remember 1974 and you went out to San Bernardino, California, and you were on a motorcycle tour, stopped at a motorcycle. Well, you've got a good memory. <laughs> or I can read. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> yes, I do remember that. 74. The motel for the night, and you're awakened the next morning by the sound of roaring engines. And whose car was parked there? Do do tell. No, it wasn't cars. That was the Hells Angels were parked there. Well. The motorcycle club. <laughs> but and I actually had my Harley Davis in the in the motel room because I had no insurance. I would if I could, if I had to have a motel room where I could always put it in on the ground level, so it wouldn't get stolen. But the parking yeah. lot next door, there were yeah, all it was a car auction, and Lauren right. Bacall, Lauren Bacall's T Bird was there. Elizabeth Taylor's T Bird. Elizabeth Taylor's T Bird. Okay. Yeah, it was her black '57 T Bird that was there, and I wanted to buy that so bad, and I I called home. My dad didn't have any money, so I never did get it bought. But I was so convinced that I had to own a T-Bird and I went to Beneficial Finance Company and borrowed some money to get one. Turned out to be a pile of junk and that's what put me in business, actually. Mm. Yeah. yeah, Amazing. Yeah, that, that was pretty fun back then. What are you looking forward found, to? I found my life's true desire, what I wanted Calling. to do. Yeah. yeah. What are you looking forward to yeah. most this weekend? Uh. You know, I've got so many friends that are coming here, and like there's a guy yesterday I called and invited him. We've got this really high end dinner, uh, Carbone. I forget the guy's name. He's a yeah. chef around here. Yeah, very very high end. So we're putting on a dinner Friday night. And I called Ross yesterday. I said, "Look, I know that he went to Greenwich this summer, a Haggerty event. They bought the Greenwich Concord." I was just having to be talking to him and he said he when he was finished with that and he said it was disgusting that you know just no sort of um don't look after the the client you know and you got to appreciate these people spend a fortune to bring their cars here and fly their private jets here and bring their handlers and I'm really looking forward to making sure that all of our friends and the participants have a great time here and we kill them with service and kindness mm -hmm. and you know, and we're learning. I mean, we've never done this. Hell, we're learning all about it, what we're going to do right, what we're going to do wrong. And whatever whatever mistakes we make, we'll make sure that we – I want to have a lot of criticisms when we're completed of what we did good and what we did bad because we want – we're going to go in this long term. We're not playing around with this. We're going to go in it long term. And, and um, we want to build something that's never been done. 
So I'm really looking forward to seeing it. You know, the Biltmore has been a great hotel to deal with. And it's a very historic property. The property is beautiful. Yeah, we're just going to have fun with it. I'm looking forward to having the fun. Yeah. Congratulations. Another new venture, man. Another new venture for you. That's it. Um, Rob, it, it is always good to see you. It's always good to talk to you. I'm going to come back to Chatham, Ontario and spend some time with you again next time I'm in the area. Please do. Look forward to it. Can I drive that car again? Oh, I can't. It's in California. Oh, no, you're bringing it back. I got a, believe me, I got a bunch of stuff you can drive. I just <laughs> bought a Lamborghini pickup truck, too. Okay. All right. We'll do that. <laughs> I got lots of junk to drive. Cool. Lots of junk to drive. <laughs> For Thank sure. You. Thank you. All right. Good talking to you. Thanks again to my guest today, Rob Myers, Moda Miami founder and chairman and CEO, RM Group of Companies. To see my interview with Rob, go to the Cars and Culture YouTube channel, like and subscribe to see more than 140 interviews and more than 1,200 videos. I'm Jason Stein, your host. We'll see you down the road.